Awesome. Hello, everyone. Um, so we've got uh, some more stuff to do today on uh, argument from analogy. Might be able to do some homework here today, too. That was part of my plan. But I also wanted to follow up on SCT and NCT with people if they have, uh, uh, since some people hadn't watched the video yet, and see if some more questions came up. Um, I'm going to pull up some uh, more homework problems for SCT and NCT for us to maybe kill two birds with one stone here. We can clarify some more stuff with SCT and NCT and do, do some homework at the same time. Um, so uh, we'll do that in a second. But at first I want to uh, knock out a question uh, David had here in the chat about rigorous testing. So rigorous testing is not important for the exam. I'm not going to test you on it. It's still a, a worthwhile idea to be aware of um, because everything in SCT and NCT is about empirical investigation, right? We're trying to figure out what are the rules for how things um, get set up uh, in re in reality, like what the causal parameters, like the code of the matrix kind of thing, right? Trying to figure out how does our world work. And to do that, we've got to observe it, but we also need to analyze it. Um, so if we're looking for patterns, how do we know what patterns to be looking for when we're trying to figure out what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for things. So if you remember from my lecture that I linked over the weekend, I talk about how what a cause is is a matter of philosophical debate. Um, there's, it's a major topic in uh, philosophy of science, of just what are we talking about when we talk about something causing something else. So there's a lot of controversy about it, but the part that's not controversial is that at the core of any claim about causality is going to be some claim about necessary and sufficient conditions, these material conditionals. So we can at least get straight on that. Yeah, I can see you, Nathan. Are, are you able to see me and hear me? I just want to make sure everyone's in here. Oh, okay, okay. All right, good. Um, so uh, that those are the the logical parameters of conditionals becomes the basis for how we're going to analyze the data we're getting from our observations of the world to find these patterns, whether they exist or not. Is X a sufficient condition for Y? Is some candidate feature necessary or sufficient for some target feature? That's what we want to figure out. So the way we're going to do it is by taking hypotheses and then running them through the gauntlet of our actual empirical observations to see whether they fit with the data or not. Does the data support that or not? If something passes the S, if a hypothesis of a candidate being sufficient for a target or being necessary for a target passes the test, that doesn't prove that it is true. It could still be falsified in the future with some future observation. But what we know is that so far so good. Um, if we find counterexamples, then we know they're definitely not necessary or sufficient conditions, um, so we can rule them out. But uh, actually confirming these things is still going to be a matter of inductive fallibility, because as we accumulate more observations and it's still passing the test, well then so much more for the good, right? So far so good, and we've gone even further in giving it the chance to fail. And that's where rigorous testing comes in. Because if I'm not looking at the right kinds of cases, then the observations are not really adding anything of uh, epistemic merit or more evidentiary support for my hypothesis. So here's a really simple example. Let's say I was curious, like I get migraines all the time. And let's say I was curious if a certain type of painkiller like aspirin or Tylenol or something is going to help deal with my migraine pain. So the, the hypothesis would be, here would be something maybe like taking the Tylenol is a sufficient condition for the ending of the pain of my migraine. Okay? Ending the pain of my migraine is the target condition, um, and taking the Tylenol is the candidate condition, and I'm wondering whether it's sufficient. It would be weird if I never took the Tylenol when I had a migraine to see what happens. Right? If I never look at cases where the candidate is present, then my hypothesis never has the chance to fail. Or, um, if I never look at cases in which my migraine goes away, right? Or, or, I'm sorry, where my migraine fails to go away, 
then I'm not also looking at the right kinds of cases. So when we've got those counterexamples, uh, let's see, do I still have the whiteboard from yesterday? Saved. I think I deleted it. Um, mm, shoot. Um, all right, my computer's being goofy. But um, <clears throat> you remember the the counterexample cases here for SCT and NCT. Um, for SCT, it's a case, the counterexample will be a case where the candidate is present and the target is not. For NCT, it's reversed. For NCT, it's a case where the target is present and the candidate is not present. So with either one of those combos, I need to have cases in my data plot, you know, that I'm analyzing, that are representatives of each of those components of the counterexample uh, that that's happening. So, for example, let's say we're doing SCT, again with my example with the Tylenol and the migraine thing. I need to have some cases in my data where the candidate is present and then see what happens with the target. I also need to have cases where the target is not present and see what's happening with the candidate. Right? So both both need to be represented somewhere. I don't need to have a counterexample represented because that's what we're looking for. We want to see if there are counterexamples or not. If I'm testing for necessary conditions, if I'm wondering whether some candidate is necessary for some target, then I need to be looking at cases where that target is happening and see what's happening with the candidate. Or I also need to have cases where the candidate isn't present and see what's happening with the target. So if I was wondering whether, uh, let's go back to my example from the lecture um, about whether watering my plants is a necessary condition for them growing, I need to look at cases where the plants are growing and see whether they got watered or not. I also need to look at cases, as it stands to intuitive reason, where I don't water the plants and see whether they grow or not. Right? Both of those would need to be represented in my, in my experiments and in my observations, in my observational data, before I could say that I, I really tested this hypothesis rigorously. If I don't ever look at cases where there's an opportunity for the hypothesis to fail, then the fact that it passes is just trivial. But it's still true that it still passes, even if I don't have the right kind of data set. And I can give you some examples from the homework for this. But um, David and anyone else in the chat, is, is this making sense for the rigorous testing idea? Uh, and while maybe you're thinking about answering that question, Jose asked, so what is the main goal when doing it? To see if it's sufficient or necessary or both? We want to figure out both but each one of them is its own separate test. So we have to do them one at a time. Let me, um, while people are typing in uh, reactions to what I just asked about, about the rigorous testing, seeing if that's making sense, let me pull up uh, some stuff from the homework, and I can, sh I can screen share this with you. Come on, computer. Okay. This up. Okay, it's making sense, Betsy. Cool. Man, why is my computer having such trouble? Sorry for the technical difficulties here, everyone. My computer's taking its sweet time. Come on. 
Okay, here we go. Adobe Acrobat's working for me now. Uh, now I just need to get Skype to work. And David, you're, you've got a, a question brewing here. Skype isn't responding. Um, come on. Ugh. Please don't crash. There we go. Okay. Are you behaving now? <laughs> oh no. All right, sorry about those technical difficulties. All right, so David, um, it sounds like uh, this is making sense. You said, uh, okay, so because the Skittles example was always present, we need to see at least one test where it wasn't for rigorous testing purposes. Yes, if we are testing for the sufficient condition test. Because the counterexample there is candidate present, target not. So we need some cases, uh, or I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Scratch that. Sometimes I wish I had that men in black flashy thing when I like misspeak. Forget that. It's for the necessary condition test that this matters. In the necessary condition test, I need to see cases where the candidate is not present. So if the Skittles are always present, I don't get those kinds of cases. Okay. Um, and he said, if a case like that pops up on the exam, you won't have to worry about it. Correct. All I'm asking you to do on the exam is just tell me what passes or fails the SCT or NCT. And the instructions will be different for the two different types, right? In one, I'm going to ask you for what fails and where they fail. The other one, I'll ask for what passes. Um, but uh, you don't have to tell me about rigorous testing or do that kind of analysis. It's just a definitely a useful idea to have. So let me try the screen sharing thing again and see if this behaves. And we can look at some homework problems. And maybe get some, some practice here about just doing it uh, as well. So this is what caused Skype to crash a second ago. Oh, man. Mm. Okay, there we go. All right, share. Trying to connect. Will you let me know uh, when it uh, when you can see what I'm seeing. You got the textbook. It's there? Okay, all right. So just looking at this really quickly, you can tell that there are some data sets here in some of these problems where rigorous testing is not happening for either the SCT or the NCT. So take a look at case two, or I'm sorry, not case two, but problem number two. So uh, this one right here. Uh, can you, you can see my mouse when I wiggle it around, right? Is that right? Is that showing up on the screen share? Yeah, okay, awesome. All right, so I'm wiggling around here with problem number two. And we have three cases here. This is all abstracted, but imagine A is a feature, B is a feature, C is a feature, D is a feature, and G is a feature. And in the instructions for this exercise, they, they tell you that G is the target feature. This is the target. A, B, C, and D are all the candidates. So if I'm wondering 
whether a candidate is necessary or sufficient for the target. Um, here, we don't have cases where G is not present. So we can't rigorously test the sufficient condition test because there aren't any cases where the target is not present. For the sufficient condition test, the counterexample is a case where candidate is present but target is not. So for, for problem two here, nothing fails the SCT because we just don't have the right kinds of cases where it could even possibly fail. Does that make sense, everyone? Yep, okay. We also don't have cases like uh, take here with the candidate C. Because C is always present, we can't rigorously test whether C is necessary for G because there are never cases where C is not present. Okay. Um, take uh, in contrast with that, um, uh, here's a good example. Um, here in, in number three, I can't rigorously test the necessary condition for C again because C is always present. Now over here in, in, in number four, I can rigorously test for the necessary conditions for C as the candidate because I've got some cases where C isn't present. And lo and behold, we do have a counterexample. Here's a case where the target is present, but the candidate is not. So that proves that C is not necessary for G because I can get G without C. Going back up here to problem number one, I can rigorously test C as a necessary condition for G because I got cases where C is not present. But it just so happens there are no counterexamples. So here, C as a candidate passes the NCT for the target G. There's never cases of G without C, so I know C is necessary for G, or at least so far so good in terms of the evidence supporting that hypothesis. The evidence doesn't contradict it. It doesn't falsify that hypothesis. So we're good. Um, so that's a little bit about rigorous testing and, and also about just how to do these SCT and CT problems. But let's, let's, uh, would it be helpful to everyone if we just ran through a full problem here and did it the whole way? You want to do that? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, the instructions... Uh, I, it, it, when I sent out the instructions document for the uh, chapter 8, 9, and 10 homework, I told you to sort of change the way that the instructions for this exercise, what was this, uh, exercise um, 3. This is exercise 3 from chapter 9. I told you to modify it because on the exam, you're going to see problems that look exactly like this, A, B, C, D, G problems. But the instructions on the exam will, will ask you to tell me what fails, which candidate features fail the SCT for G, and which ones fail the NCT for G, and what are the cases that serve as counterexamples for whatever candidates are ruled out. So, um, if you can follow along with my voice here, um, you know, let me know uh, uh, if I need to go a little slower here. But let's do SCT first. We've got four candidate features, A, B, C, and D, and our target feature is G. So, it do, is, does A pass or fail the SCT for G? Chat? Yes, it passes, Jose, because there are no counterexamples. There are no cases where the candidate is present, where A is present, and G is not. So because A passes, you would not put it on the list of what fails. All you got to do for the exam answer here would say uh, list the candidates that fail and which cases rule them out. Is B passing or failing the SCT for G? It's failing. Yes, it does fail. And why does it fail? Which case is the counterexample? Case two, that's right. In case two, the candidate is present. Uh, we're looking at problem number one, Dania. Problem number one here. In case two here, B is present and G is not. That's the counterexample for the sufficient condition test. So on your answers, if this was an exam problem, you'd, you'd have a, a header that says fails SCT. You'd write B 
and then maybe a semicolon or something, and case 2. Case 2 is what proves that B fails the SCT for G. Now let's go over to C. And, and stop me if you got any questions as we're going here. Does C pass or fail the SCT for G? It passes. That's right. No counterexamples, so you wouldn't put it on the list. Um, so, I'm sorry. Uh, Betsy here, you, what did you say here? Uh, so for case, um, SCT case 3 for B doesn't affect it at all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, case 3 is not the counterexample for the SCT with B as the candidate and G as the target. Because with the SCT, the only counterexample we're worried about are cases where the candidate is present and the target is not. Case 3 is going to come back and be relevant in a little bit, but not for the SCT. <clears throat> Yeah, so C also passes. No counterexamples there. How about D? Is D passing or failing the SCT for G? Yep, it fails. And what's the counterexample? Case 2. Case 2, yeah. Um, Nathan, the uh, A, B, C, and D are being defined as the candidate conditions, and G is the target condition. So yeah, case 2 is a counterexample for D being sufficient for G, because D is present and G is not. Okay, so just to sum it up, the answer, if this was an exam problem, your answer for what fails the SCT would be B, case 2, and then D, case 2. Now if we wanted to do the NCT, which you also are going to have to do, uh, we want to list which candidates fail the NCT for G and what cases rule them out. So is A failing the NCT for G? Is it passing or failing? Yep, it passes. How about B? Yes, B fails. And what case is the counterexample for B being necessary for G? Case 3, that's right. Because here, you're getting G, but no B. So that shows, that proves, that you can have G without B. B is not necessary to make G happen. So while case 3 was not a counterexample for the sufficient condition test for B, it is a counterexample for the necessary condition test for B. And you can't do the necessary and sufficient condition test simultaneously. you got to do them one at a time. Yep, Nathan, you're exactly right. Target is present when the candidate isn't, and that's the counterexample for the necessary condition test. Same thing for D, right? Case 3 is going to rule it out as well. And there are no counterexamples for C. So for the NCT, when I ask what fails the NCT, the answer would be B, case 3, and D, case 3. Now, in this problem that we just demonstrated, there were only ever one counterexamples for each of the failure cases. But sometimes there can be more than one. So um, <clears throat> let's go to... Um, I'm scrolling down here. Um, here we go. Let's look at problem number 6. C... Candidate feature C fails the SCT for G in two cases. You've got case 2 and case 3. Both of these, the candidate condition is present, and yet the target is not. So that proves that C is not all it takes to make G happen. C is not sufficient for G. But there's two counterexamples. If this was on the exam, I'd be expecting you to give me both. All it takes is one to, to make it fail, but I want you to be able to recognize all counterexample cases, so I'll be asking for that on the exam. Does that make sense? Yep, okay. Any, any other questions here? How are we doing? 
Is this is SCT NCT feeling better? Cool, cool, awesome. Here, yeah, while well, maybe if anyone's thinking about whether they got some more questions here, I will take this moment to give you the code word. The code word for today is uh, what did I? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, spring training. So it's spring training. I'm a big Cubs fan, so very excited. Whenever spring training rolls around, that's that's the code word. Looks like Nathan's got a question here. No, oh, okay, okay. Um, so I, I do want to have us finish up um, argument from analogy. So I'm going to switch gears for that, and because uh, we've got like 20 minutes left for class, so let's do that. And um, and then tomorrow's our official homework day. But really, like I, I said yesterday, and put in the weekend update email, every day starting tomorrow is just going to be exam review. So we'll we'll definitely want to prioritize chapter 8, 9, 10 for tomorrow. Um, but then Thursday and Friday, my guess is we'll probably also talk about some 8, 9, 10 stuff, but we could also do some formal logic too um, uh, if people had questions about that. But the rest of the week is all about preparing for exam two. Okay, uh, I'm going to do more screen sharing here, and we'll pull up our whiteboard that we had from yesterday. Um, let's do this here. All right. Okay. Is this working? I hope so. <laughs> Why is Skype having such trouble today? It's like working overtime. Come on, you can do a computer. Um, are you seeing, uh, is everyone seeing, um, the Microsoft Paint whiteboard yet? No. Okay. All right. I don't know why it's having some trouble. Oh, boy. All right, so I'm having these technical difficulties. We're going to redo this, what I had yesterday. Uh, we got this. And we're going to need some lines here. You're seeing it? Awesome. Okay. So. Making this beautiful face again. got an inference going this way and remember these are going to be decided similarities this is down here property X which is the property in question here is the case we're not sure about which I'm calling the disputed case and this is going to be the analogous case or cases. Right? Could be could be multiple ones there. And we had this is like P and Q and R and so on. Um, whatever whatever R, there could just be one. There could be many. Um, you know, it just depends on the problem. But these are the basic moving parts. Okay. Now, in terms of the standards, how do we evaluate analogies when they're being offered? Um, a few things, there are three things that I'm asking you to pay attention to. Um, so kind of like how in the statistical generalizations there was the should we accept the premises, the book has something like that, then like, I don't care about that. 
Um, but the three that we care about are um, going to be about the relevance of the cited similarities, which I'm going to draw as this little like uh, dashed line here. And this is going to happen for each of these. Each of the cited similarities we have to evaluate individually, which is the first major point about these standards. Um, we got to evaluate them individually. And then, uh, let me, can I do this? Uh, let's do, yeah, there we go. So there's the relevance of them, and then there's like the importance of them. And I'm drawing this as like a thicker line that's got some like girth to it here, like this. There we go. And then there's something else we'll have to talk about in a second here. But first, let's talk about. Um, Standard number one, which is relevance, and then standard number two, which is importance. Okay, these kind of go hand in hand with each other. Um, so, uh, what are we asking when we're asking whether the cited similarities are relevant to the property in question? That's the first thing to ask, and we have to do this individually. So, each one of these taken by itself needs to be evaluated in a vacuum. I mentioned yesterday that uh, we don't care how many there are. The, the number of cited similarities in itself is not meaningful because it all depends on sort of the quality of the cited similarities. And there's two metrics we're using to evaluate the what they're contributing to the, the rational force of the analogy itself, and one of those is relevance. So with relevance, I drew it as a dashed line because the question we're really asking with relevance is just, is there any thread of connection between these cited similarities and the property in question? So, uh, and if so, if that is the case, then what is the basis of that connection? So let's, let's do a, 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 one of the problems from the homework here. Let's discuss it. It's one of the first ones. It said uh, something like... Um, this uh, p painting by Cezanne is beautiful. Therefore, this other landscape that he drew at a similar, or he painted at a similar time, is also going to be beautiful. What are the cited similarities in this case? Um, well, the disputed case is the other painting property in question is being beautiful. The analogous case is this painting, the one we're looking at right now, that is obviously beautiful. Um, and the cited similarities would be things like they're both painted by Cezanne, they were painted around the same time, they're both about uh, landscapes which are similar, so the subject matter is similar. So we got to look at all those cited similarities uh, individually. So do you think that there's a relevant connection between the artist who painted the painting and whether it's going to be beautiful or not? What do you think, chat? Yes, I agree with you, Andrew. Yeah, I, I think there's a relevant connection here. The thing you have to do to give a really good answer here, though, is explain it. So if you think it's relevant, what's the grounds of the relevance? What are the background assumptions? I told you background assumptions would be present in all of these inductive argument evaluations. Um, you've got to use your knowledge of the world, um, which could be different from person to person. Um, but what, what makes you think that there's a connection of relevance between the artist and whether or not the work of art is going to be beautiful? I like doing this problem because beauty is the kind of thing that we think is being subjective. You know, we might have some very different background assumptions about this, um, but it doesn't mean that because it's subjective or subject to taste that there isn't any rational structure to it whatsoever. The artist is using the same tools to paint both works of art and he has the same amount of experience. Um, Nathan said that. Uh, Dania says the artist will use similar techniques and style with their paintings. Andrew said both paintings are by the same painter. The painter has reputation for their works and their paintings will have similar style. So all those things that you're that the three of you were pointing at still need to be connected with beauty. So um, let's say the, the idea about technique. 
that technique, uh, the kind of skill with which one is able to handle paints, is going to have a, con a contribution to beauty. So someone who really knows what they're doing with making a landscape like look uh, pleasing, you know, that they know how to make it happen, um, is important for whether the painting is actually going to be beautiful. Uh, their ability to execute on a vision, there's, there's skill involved with painting. It's not just about pure artistic vision but it, it has to do a little bit with ability. And then experience might also weigh in on that kind of level. Um, Andrew, I'm, I'm kind of wondering about the reputation thing. I don't know if that is maybe the most direct basis of the relevance, um, because just because there's a reputation for something doesn't actually mean that, it, that the reputation is what makes it beautiful. Um, does that make sense to you, Andrew? But the part about the similar style, I mean, if you think one of those styles is beautiful, um, if, if you think that style itself is a, con a contributor to the beauty, then the fact that the same painter is going to paint two different paintings with the same style is very, um, gonna, that, that, then that's going to have a connection with the beauty itself. Maybe the style is what's contributing to the beauty. This is a, I chose a, a somewhat complicated case here. Um, oh, uh, I think so. Reputation came to mind as being known to make beautiful paintings. Ah, uh-huh, uh-huh. But, <laughs> pardon me, everyone. Oh. <laughs> ah, sorry. Um, but you can kind of get a picture here. Thank you, Nathan. Um, you can get a picture here for what kind of thinking you have to do when you're testing relevance. No, I do not think I have coronavirus, no. Um, just cold outside. Kind of sniffly. Uh, okay, so, pardon me. When you're evaluating relevance, you got to take each cited similarity one at a time and, uh, and, and ask yourself, do I think there's any ground of connection for tying these things together? And I want to emphasize here, no matter how thin the thread is, you should still identify it. Anything that doesn't have any thread whatsoever connecting it with the property in question is just not going to make, it, it's not going to make any contribution to making the analogy stronger, uh, which is why we don't care how many similarities there are if they aren't relevant to the thing we're trying to make a judgment about. But after you've uh, recognized that cited similarities are relevant, you also need to ask if they're important. And how could we articulate what importance is getting you to think about? Um, I like uh, wording it this way. When you're, when you're thinking about whether a cited similarity is important to the property in question, you need to think about whether that cited similarity is at the top of the list for the things that make the biggest impact in whether or not something has this property or not. So really, you've got to be thinking about maybe some other stuff. Like what are the other things that contribute to something having property X or not? It's not just limited. With relevance, you're just looking in a vacuum P and X. Is there a thread of connection between them? And if so, what's the basis of that connection? When you're testing the importance of P, you're like, how does P stack up against all of the things that I think influence whether something has property X or not? And is P one of the central determining factors or variables in determining whether something has property X or not? So when you're asking, is the fact that both paintings were painted by Cezanne, that they have the same artist here, is that one of the most important factors in determining whether the painting is beautiful or not? What do you think? And again, I, I don't care so much what you think, <laughs> as long as in your answers on the exam, your explanation demonstrates that you understand in principle what importance is about. Yeah, so Nathan, what I'm, what I'm asking is, do you think that the cited similarity, that the paintings were both painted by Cezanne, same artist, is that one of the most important factors that influences whether a work of art is going to be beautiful or not? How does it square up against all the other things that might influence the beauty of the painting? Is it one of the, one of the most important, one of the centrally significant factors in determining beauty? 
So you have to kind of think, what are all the different variables that I think affect the beauty of a painting is having the same painter up at the top of the list. So Nathan says no, because there could be other artists who are good painters. That actually is not uh, super relevant for determining importance. It's not like we're saying it has to be Cezanne in order for it to be beautiful. The point is whether having the same artist, like what the artist's uh, contribution makes, that that's one of the most important variables for whether or not the painting is going to be beautiful. Here, while, while you're uh, writing in the chat here, everyone, I'm going to set up the last standard for us. Well, if you notice paintings are beautiful, then it's safe to assume this one is too. So, Jose, you're, all you're offering here is just argument from analogy. You're saying, well, it's the same thing, so they must be beautiful. The question is, we have to evaluate that. Are we looking in the right spot for figuring out what is going to be a guide to something else? Andrew says, it depends. The painter might only have one beautiful work and the rest are crap. Or they could have many and are all beautiful works. Alex says, I'm going to say yes, assuming the artist is consistent with their art and style. Betsy says, I think it's less the artist and more the art style, which is still the artist, because if painting one is beautiful for whatever reason, painting two will probably be done in the same style. I mean, maybe, maybe not. I mean, you might say whether it's in the same style is way more important than the artist, because even though it's about the artist, um, whether the artist is skilled in that style or not, whether they're playing around with something that they're less familiar with, that's going to be more important for the beauty. Um, but someone else might be like, well, the artist is the one that ultimately is holding the, the paintbrush. You know, they're the ones that have the, the vision that then they're going to express in their art. And so they're the choke point for where, where what's going to determine what happens with that painting. So, and or or maybe something like skill is super important here. And so because it's the same person, they're going to have the same skill set, and that's the basis for the importance. You can do all sorts of answers here. Jose is saying this is a hard argument because beauty is so relative, and that's my point. I, I chose this one because there still is logic to get at here, even if it's a matter of deep subjectivity, and. All that matters is what your background assumptions are. So I'm again, I don't grade you on the background assumptions, but what you're doing with them, how you're reasoning with them. And there's plenty of room to reason about artistic work, um, at least in just expressing intelligibly what's your view about it. You know, what do you find beautiful and what do you not find beautiful? If you wanted to reduce the property in question in this scenario to just a painting I will find beautiful, that would be fine. Right? We could definitely make progress on that. If you're trying to just anticipate whether you're going to find this other painting beautiful or not, well, what are the variables that affect your taste? What are the most important things that seem to determine whether you find something beautiful or not beautiful? Maybe that helps. Um, I, I'm eager here to get to uh, discussing uh, the last standard here, just so that we have it represented. Um, uh, I want to do that, uh, and then we can talk more about all this stuff tomorrow too. Um, but the last standard is very, very important. It is uh, whether there are disanalogous cases. So once we've got uh, the analogy that's on the table to be evaluated, we've looked at the relevance and importance of the cited similarities there, we still have to think about whether there's something else going on that could blunt the force of that original analogy, and that's a disanalogy. So remember again my convention here that everything in black is something that's given to you in the problem you're analyzing, and everything in red is stuff that you have to come up with out of your own imagination. And so that's why I'm doing all of this in red right now. Um, I think the easiest way to think about disanalogies is like a tug-of-war metaphor. So 
Uh, oh yeah, so the um, the three red lines down here, Dania, are these the ones that you're wondering about? Yeah, okay. So I was saying that when you're when you're testing relevance, all you've got to look at is just P and X in a vacuum and ask, is there any thread of connection here? You gotta think about your background assumptions for what would be the basis of their connection between them, having a relevant connection. But when you're testing importance, now you gotta widen up the circle of your imagination a little bit. And you're comparing P as an indicator of X against all the other things that you think might be indicators of X and figure out whether P, Q, R, and so on are at the top of the list in terms of the centrally most significant factors in determining whether anything has property X or not. So that's what these other lines are about. They're like things that maybe were not offered in the analogy, but that you have background assumptions surrounding property X about. You're like, these are other things that influence X. Are the cited similarities at the top of the list of things that influence whether or not something has X? That's what importance is all about. Is that helping? Okay, okay, cool, awesome. All right, so back to the, the third standard here. Oops, I don't want that, I want this. Standard number three asks, are there relevant disanalogies? So think about this like a tug of war. I've got questions. Does the disputed case have property X or not? Well, maybe it does, because it's similar to these analogous cases that also have property X. So there's an inference going in this way. It sort of pushes me to think, oh yeah, the disputed case does have property X. But what if there are also disanalogous cases, cases that don't have property X that are also similar to the disputed case? So that might suggest that it doesn't have property X. All right? So it's like a competing argument from analogy that just pulls in the opposite direction. Even if you've got some, some cases that indicate that the disputed case does have the property, if there are also disanalogous cases that indicate that it doesn't have that property, then we're kind of back to square one, right? The, I can't really accept the original analogy as providing strong reason for thinking that the disputed case has property X if there are also other good reasons because of this disanalogous case for thinking it doesn't have that property. And I wrote this PQR and STU because these disanalogous cases, they could be cases that share the cited similarities with the disputed case, but just don't have property X. But they could also be cases that have new properties that have not been talked about so far in the problem that also make them similar to the disputed case. There just needs to be some basis of connection between the disanalogous case and the disputed case. So what's an example, Jose? Um, let me let me come up with a, just kind of a goofy one. So let's stick to the Cezanne thing, right? This other painting that was painted by Cezanne. If there was another painting that I saw by Cezanne um, around the same time and also... Uh, so it was painted by Cezanne, it was painted around the same time, and it's of a similar scene, just like in the original analogy. But I was like, that painting sucks. Then we've got a disanalogous case, right? So... Uh, so earlier in our conversation when we were evaluating the analogy, someone brought up like, well, it kind of depends on the artist. Like, how re how uh, reliably do they paint beautiful paintings, right? And trying to evaluate how important the being the same painter was. Well, those cases that you're thinking of, they could just be disanalogy cases, right? Other paintings by Cezanne that I didn't really care for. I didn't think they were that great. So that makes them similar to the disputed case of this other painting. So maybe that's a reason to think it's not going to be good. Or, and here's a really goofy one, imagine that there was this other painting um, that was painted with human feces. Sorry to make a gross example here. but the And I was like, not beautiful. This painting painted with human feces, not beautiful. And turns out that the disputed case was painted with human feces. That's a good reason to think it's also not going to be beautiful. I don't know if that's too goofy of an example for you, Jose, or for the rest of you in the chat, but does that make sense? Notice the original analogy didn't come up with that at all. It wasn't talking about that, but you could still maybe anticipate that. One, one difficult issue here is that 
a lot of the problems in the homework and even the case that's going to be on the exam, you don't know everything about this uh, disputed case and what other properties. You kind of just have the ones that you're given to work with here. But you might be able to think up what would be a hypothetical disanalogous case and talk about that in your answer of like, well, maybe this is going on. If the disputed case had these properties, well, I know of cases that also have those properties that don't have the property in question. You could describe that in your answer, and then I would know that you know what disanalogies are all about, and I could give you full credit. Um, maybe we can, when we get together tomorrow, we can talk about the uh, homework problem here that was about the Siamese cat, uh, whether the Siamese cat's going to bite me or something. That'll be a really good example of an analogy where you're not given a whole lot of facts about the disputed case to work with, but you could maybe anticipate where disanalogies could maybe come from, something like that. Um, before I leave you for today, uh, I'm sorry we're running a little late here uh, for me finishing up. Um, I do want to offer one other word of warning. When I've taught this class in the past, um, and it comes around to disanalogy cases, oftentimes students um, think of disanalogies for the analogous case. Cases that are, are going to make you think that this doesn't work out the way that it does. And that isn't required. You need a disanalogy to the disputed case. You need a case that's similar to the disputed case, not one that's similar to the analogous cases. Okay? Make sure that that's what's going on. The thread of connection here is between the disputed case, the case of the conclusion, and the disanalogy cases. And the way that you really are looking for them is by looking for cases that don't have the property in question. Don't think about disanalogies that do have the property in question but differ in terms of the cited similarities. You need to think of a case that doesn't have the property in question that shares similarities with the disputed case. That's going to be the real key here. Okay, um, another, another warning that's kind of on this level. Many times when students explain their answers about relevance and importance, they really end up talking about disanalogies. So you've got to be careful about that. These three standards are different from each other, and mixing them up uh, happens very frequently, and I'm not going to be able to give a whole lot of partial credit for that. Uh, so I think getting more advice about how to avoid that danger is something that we can do in running through some more examples together from the homework. So, But I just want to kind of flag that for our conversations tomorrow uh, when we do some homework. I, I'll try to bring up that theme again and we can talk about it. Okay, uh, I will let you go for today. If anyone wants to stick around though and has some more questions here before you leave, uh, if you've got the time, um, I'm happy to answer them. I'm here uh, and so uh, I, I've got break for the next hour so if anyone wants to ask some questions right now we can do that. Anyone got anything you want to talk about? It's okay, Parker. Yes, yes. I will be uploading it in, you know, next 20, 30 minutes. It should be. Usually I, I've been pretty good about being able to get it up within about 30 minutes.